Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my brother, who runs a channel called Forgotten Lives. He lately did a really dynamite story, super interesting, and I know it's something that most of you will really, really enjoy. So, all that I ask is that you give him a chance, check him out, and I know you'll really enjoy his content. The link can be found on screen and in the description. On screen at the end of the video, of course. Uh, and I'd really appreciate it if you guys would check him out and show him some love. He really does deserve it. But anyway, without further ado, it's time to get comfortable. Check your backs and let the darkness take control. When I was 15 years old, I lived in a rural area about 20 minutes away outside of the town I called home. I was home from school alone one day, and a white car pulled up in front of our mailbox and stopped. I was upstairs in my room, and saw from the window, but could not see who was in the car. Whoever it was sat there for several minutes, without getting out of the vehicle, long enough to weird me out and then drove away. We weren't super close in distance to our neighbours, but we weren't miles and miles apart, and I remembered that one neighbour, a bit down, was selling their house, and I chalked it up to a potential buyer having the wrong address, or simply checking out the neighbourhood, and thought nothing else of it. Fast forward about a week or two. It was a Friday night, and I had gone down to see the premiere of a movie with my boyfriend at the time. I remember it was a special occasion, and I had begged my parents to consistently for weeks to push back my curfew so that I could see this movie, since it wouldn't be over until about 1am, and it took 20 minutes to get home from town. They were reluctant, but finally agreed. When the movie was over, my boyfriend Jason and I walked slowly to the truck. It was a well-lit and relatively safe area, so we stood around in the parking deck to try and push curfew for as long as possible. There weren't many vehicles at that time of night, but I realised that I recognised the one parked across from us. The same white car that had been at my house a week earlier. The car was running and there was a man in his mid-thirties sitting alone inside. I could have passed all of this off as a coincidence, except as I continued to look at him, he turned his bright lights on us and spun out of the parking deck, almost running into Jason's truck. I obviously had a horrible feeling about this, and asked Jason to take me home immediately. As we pulled out of the garage, we saw the car parked across the street from the movie theatre. All of the lights off, man still inside. But he didn't follow us, so we just went home a little shaken. I had no idea at that moment. This was the start of three long and treacherous years. A couple of months after the parking situation, the encounters became more frequent and weirder and I hated being anywhere alone at any time. I never knew when I would see him, or how much time would pass between encounters. It became clear that he was watching me all the time by this point, because he only made himself known when I was alone or with my boyfriend, never with my parents or even other friends. I became terrified that none of my friends would believe me if I told them, so I kept it between Jason and my family. Until one day, my friend Rachel, who lives maybe five miles from me, started telling me about this creepy man who showed up at her house over the weekend. Rachel's dad worked Saturdays, so she was home alone with another friend of ours, Megan. Everything was normal until around dusk when they began to smell cigarette smoke. My heart instantly began racing. By this time, this was becoming an everyday occurrence for me. I was smelling cigarette smoke, and finding cigarette butts around my house. 
even though none of my family smoked. And I could never trace the source. I had a nagging feeling, of course, that it was connected to this guy, but hadn't confirmed it. So as Rachel and Megan were looking for the source, Rachel realised she had left a window open in the back room, and the smoke was coming from there. Seeing as there was a strange man on her porch, she quickly goes to close and lock the window, and in her words, he turns around with dead eyes, and looks straight through her like she wasn't really there. Megan immediately called the police, but Rachel continued to stand there in shock, as he smirked at her, and stared until his cigarette was done. He then got up, and calmly walked away. The police came but found no trace of him, except the cigarette butts on the porch, and scattered around the backyard, indicating that he had been there for quite some time. I immediately began to describe this guy to Rachel, and it was the same one. She hadn't seen or heard the white car at all, and they guessed that he had parked down the road and walked down Rachel's almost mile-long driveway, or through the woods a bit. As time went on, my stories were well documented with the police department, but they had never even seen the guy. He was good at getting away, you see. I have to give them credit, because they never doubted the truth in my stories, and always showed up quickly, even as it became apparent that this guy knew what he was doing, and wasn't planning to be caught anytime soon. We also began to suspect he had a police scanner in his car, one night in particular, almost two years after the Rachel incident, Jason and I were coming home a little early on a date. My parents had gone out as well that night, and we had a strict rule that we couldn't be home alone with no adults. So Jason and I began to talk in the driveway, since my dad had called and they were only about ten minutes away. We were too scared given the circumstances to get out of the truck, and we kept our eyes peeled for the creep. But we figured ten minutes wasn't all that long. Sure as the world, not a minute later we saw headlights turn on in the bushes across the street from my driveway. This freak had backed his car into the bushes and waited for us to come home. Jason immediately got onto the phone with the cops, and I called my dad, who was literally flying home at this point. As the man revved up his engine and flashed his lights, he then proceeded to get out of his car and walk towards Jason's truck. I will never forget how slow his walk was, methodical and emotionless. It felt like I was living out of a serial killer movie. I was sobbing. We had the doors locked, of course, and the man walked up the passenger side where I was sitting and stood only a few feet away from the window staring at me. He never made a move for the door. He simply stood there, completely still, and stared. He held eye contact with me, with his eyes like black holes. Jason was a baseball player, and had been keeping a bat in the back seat exactly for a moment like this. He pulled me towards him and away from the window, grabbed the bat, but the man didn't even flinch. He switched his gaze to the bat for a few seconds, smiled this huge and disgusting grin, walked back to his car, and drove away. It seemed like 40 minutes passed, but it couldn't have been more than five, because the man had only been gone a few minutes before my dad came into our driveway doing 80. The cops never caught up to him. There were many more stories of torture, such as leaving dead animals outside our front door and shining flashlights into our windows in the middle of the night. But nothing anyone ever did could trip this guy. My family had tried everything. My older brother had even desperately tried to chase the guy through the woods behind our house one night, but lost him. The police wanted help, but they only had my stories and the corroboration of my boyfriend, Rachel's encounter, and one kind of vague sighting in a car in the town. I didn't even have a name for anyone to file a restraining order against, 
not that it would have done me much good. And maybe the creepiest part of this all. In three years, he never spoke a single word. Then one day, just as quickly as he showed up, every single trace of him completely disappeared. Just like that. I never knew if he died, was arrested for some other crime, or just lost interest, even though that seems highly unlikely. I just simply never saw him again, and it's been 10 years now. Creeps come in all shapes and sizes, and many of them do not look like what you see in the movies. They can seem like completely ordinary regular people on the outside. However, this man's behaviour was exactly like something from a horror movie. Something in his eyes was so evil, it would turn your stomach. Over the course of three years, he made my life extremely stressful and terrifying. And even now, that I live in a different state, I sometimes half expect him to show up again. I still occasionally feel the lasting effects of that time. But thankfully, my life has become pretty normal again. Needless to say, disturbed stalker who made me feel miserable for years, let's not meet. I also have a bonus story. Just this year I was scouring YouTube for creepy stories, as one does, and came across something about a true stalker story by a female YouTuber I wasn't familiar with. My stomach turned. Her story was almost identical to mine, down to the cigarette butts in her yard. The description of his empty eyes and his white car. I knew in my heart. It was the same guy. So I did a little research on the girl. She's the same age as me. The weird events began when she was 15. And she grew up just one town over from me. I was floored. I've reached out to her, but haven't heard back yet. Maybe one day, soon. In 2016, I had just turned 18, and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to take a few specialised classes that were requirements for my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. That's relevant because I was going to a town that I didn't know much about and I didn't know anyone who lived there. There was a man in my class called Eddie. He was a big guy in his late forties. I'm five foot nothing, and at the time, 130 pounds, which is just to say I'm pretty small and defenseless. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes, and he was stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at the time, and wanted to be nice, so I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit, and was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly with me, and would stand too close and ask many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in class, to the point it seemed to make other people uncomfortable to watch. He also started staring at me a lot, with an intense look that scared me. Of course, being young, and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hadn't actually done anything to me, so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do. A few weeks after that started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam in our next class, which was about 30 minutes away. I was sitting at one table chatting with some middle-aged women in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messaging with his phone. I announced that I was going to go get something from the vending machine, and stood up. As I did, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone towards me, and snapped pictures of me as I walked to the machine to get my drinks, and bent over to pick it up. I realised what was going on, just as I was walking back to my seat, with him still taking photos, 
and I shot him a look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me. I was trying to look furious, but honestly, I was just more freaked out. I excused myself from the table and called my boyfriend in tears, telling him what had happened. He was angry and said that I needed to tell someone, but I said no. I didn't want to make a scene. He tried to comfort me as much as he could, but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class time finished at about 9pm, and since it was January, it was completely dark out when we all walked to our cars. I was actually texting some of my guy friends about what had happened, when Eddie walked up to my car, stopped for a second and looked at me through the windshield. Then, slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked no way near me, and the wind chill was below zero, so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified, and with my hands shaking, I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way, and crying. After that, I decided I need to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was so nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when class was over. We went to her office, and I told her about Eddie, and what he had done, and how he acted weird towards me. She told me that she had noticed tensed up, and went quiet when he got close to me, and had noticed him paying a lot of attention to me and told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled it. She promised me that she would move things around where I'd be away from him in the lab, and asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it. I said no, that I didn't want to make him angry, and she said that she'd respect that, but she was going to have the security guard stand at the door and watch me go to my car every night and that she'd tell the program director what was going on, but that Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we got done, it had been about 30 minutes since class had ended, and she offered to walk me outside. I'm glad she did, because when we came out of the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting in the foyer alone. Everyone else had gone home. My blood ran cold but I tried to act as normally as I could. He seemed as surprised to see our professor there as she was to see him. She asked why he was still here, and he said he noticed my car was still parked out front, and wanted to make sure I didn't have to walk out by myself. I'm pretty sure I was pale as a ghost, but my professor gave him a look that I couldn't read, and said not to worry. She's walking me to my car, and from now on the security guard will be there every night. He said that was good, and quickly said goodnight and left. It still sends chills every time I think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating, made sure we were never grouped together, and I started making sure I walked out to my car at the same time as a few of the other women in my class. The security guard was usually in the foyer, and we only had a few more months before the class finished, so there weren't really any more incidents, but I still caught him staring at me sometimes, and he looked like pure rage. It's been a few years, and I don't go to the school anymore, and I'm moving to a completely different city soon, I am a lot more assertive and stronger now, but Eddie, let's never meet again. I had a friend who went crazy. She sent a guy 65,000 texts after one date and broke into his house. Now a lot of people may have heard about this girl. She was all over the news after she stalked a guy bombarded him with that many messages, and broke into his house all over one date. We met shortly after she went on that date with him, and we were friends for a while before she broke into his house. At first, she seemed like a nice, albeit quirky person. 
I met her when I spent a couple of months visiting the west coast of the U.S. in summer of 2017. I thought she was cute, and we spent a lot of time together. We were living next door to each other for a few weeks, and we were never really more than friends. I have stopped any sort of non-platonic feelings after she started to talk a lot about a guy she had met on some dating website. Apparently, he was her soulmate. And she had somehow been guided to him by following her birth calendar. I would only later come to know that they had only been on one date, and he never spoke to her again. I thought that was weird, but I enjoyed our conversations, and for the most part, she was funny and nice, so we remained friends. Eventually, she moved on to short flings with a guy and another girl from Tinder. All the while, still talking to me about this guy that she was going to marry, saying that she liked how jealous he got when she would tell him about hooking up with other people. A couple of weeks later, she started to get really erratic. I confronted her a few times about how she was acting, and she told me that she had recently stopped taking her meds, but would start again soon. She came home one day. And decided to tell me that she had a court date coming up for a DUI. I have no idea if this is actually true, but if there's a way to find out, it happened in Arizona, and her name is pretty easy to find, so someone could look it up if they wanted to know. Her plan was instead to leave the country and to go to South America. I told her what a dumb idea that was, even though she was actually going to go all the way to the airport in a different city to do so. She did it, but ended up coming back. Apparently, her soulmate was no longer answering her texts, and she took that as a sign that she should drag her ass back to where he was to fix their relationship. She was upset that he may be seeing other people, even though it seemed okay for her to do that. Later on, she told me that she had messaged him, and she said if he blocked her. She would know that meant he wanted her to come and find him. Obviously, he blocked her. Obviously, that didn't go well with her. She moved a couple of days later, and the summer was ending, and I moved back to the East Coast. I didn't hear from her for a little while, but then we started talking again through text and WhatsApp. She seemed like she was doing better, and she told me she had found a roommate. And was working on her art again, and just generally seemed like she was in a better place. I was happy to have my friend back and healthy, but that didn't last more than a few months. Eventually, her behavior seemed erratic again, and she started sending dozens of texts at a time, and they were all over the place. Several of them had to do with her soulmate, and how she was still following him even though he had called the police and blocked her. I told her to stop, tried to get her to take her meds, and tried to reason with her a hundred times. I was on the opposite side of the country and had no way of getting in touch with her family, who I didn't really know much about, or her friends, and tried to get them to assist her. She was a kind person and a good friend when she was taking care of her mental health, and I cared about her. But I couldn't force her to take care of herself. One day, I set aside some time to call her, and I told her that she was overwhelming me, and that she really needed to reach out to her family or someone who could help her. She told me that she couldn't do that because she needed to stay with me, or she would have to go back to her ex-husband. I don't think any of this is true, but she thought her ex-husband was going to have her ended. Or perhaps followed, that he had the entire police force in his pocket, and he had paid off her family to give him intel on her whereabouts and what she was doing in her life. I had just moved for a job, and I lived in a studio in a big city. It was quite small, and I had no room for anyone staying there for the long term, and I wasn't about to do that anyway, since she was starting to frighten me at this point. She asked me if I was still living at my address, which really freaked me out, as I'd never given it to her or put it anywhere on the internet, and she wouldn't tell me how she obtained it. 
I asked her to leave me alone, and told her we couldn't be friends anymore unless she took some steps to make herself better, and she obviously didn't take this very well. Though I hated my tiny cramped apartment, the reason I was drawn to it was because it had great security. It was actually on the upper floors of a hotel, although the hotel rooms were much nicer than the residence, and no one was allowed through the residence elevator unless the resident had given their name to security ahead of time, and the guest had shown ID. After what happened next, I loved my cramped little apartment, because the staff kept me safe. It had been over a week since I had spoken to her because I had blocked her numbers and blocked her on WhatsApp. She tried messaging me from four different phone numbers using texts free and stuff, but I blocked them as well and never replied. I was walking home from work one day, and I was sure I saw her across the street from my building, but it was storming out and I didn't manage to get a good view. I rushed upstairs and calmed myself down in my apartment. Maybe I was just being paranoid. It's a big city, there are lots of people that have brown hair and glasses. I'm just worried about her. But then the phone rang. The desk was calling to see if I had forgotten to let them know I had a visitor. My heart sank. I asked them who was waiting. They said they had tried asking for her name or ID, but she just walked out and I knew it was her from the way they described her. I messaged a mutual friend over the summer. I wasn't really close with him, so we hadn't stayed in touch, but he told me that he had lost it, and that he had blocked her too. Apparently she had gone back on the dating site, where she met her soulmate, and found someone who looked just like him in my city. She was convinced it was him, and had to come and find him. This was a very touristy city, but there was just no way this guy had coincidentally come out here. I was sure she had gone bonkers, and I knew she was well aware of where the guy actually lived. I took a page out of her book, and used a text-free number to text her that she should leave me alone, and I would call the cops if she ever came near my building again. In retrospect, I should have never contacted her at all, but I was emotional, and not using my better judgement. She said she still wanted to know if I could help her find something. She texted back really fast and didn't even try to hide it. Then I deleted the entire text-free app, so that she wouldn't be able to reach me again. I lived in a very crowded area, and I knew she couldn't get into my building but I was still scared whenever I had to take public transit alone at night, or was walking through less crowded areas to get home. I had a friend who used to work for the police, but not in this city at the time this all happened, and she would drive or walk me home from work whenever she could stay a while. She told me I could go ahead and report it, even though they couldn't really do anything since she hasn't hurt anyone and nothing really happened but I was embarrassed, and again, I didn't use my better judgement. I felt like it was my fault for engaging with her for so long. I knew she was mentally unstable, and I would still try to be her friend and help her. Maybe I gave her the wrong idea that I could do more for her. I ended up moving to a new city for another job after that, and didn't hear from her again. I later found out the reason why and that was a couple of months later. She had once again gone back to Arizona, and had been arrested for breaking into her soulmate's house, and using his bathtub. They found a very large knife in the car. I didn't want to go into too much detail about her stalking of this guy, and what she said about him in our messages, because I wanted to try and focus more on my personal experience with her, instead of his. Just so you know, some of the messages included violence, and talked about wanting to cut off some of his body parts and wear them. Talk about crazy. So this all happened throughout my high school experience. I am currently a janitor at my school, and this all happened in the second semester of my freshman year. The first incidents 
were closer to the end of my freshman year. There were a few in my sophomore year, and there has only been one so far in my junior year, and it's all completely true. I tried looking for the police records to go with it, but I couldn't find anything, because of how long ago it was. I'm going to give you some background, so you understand better what I'm getting at. I'm itsy bitsy, five foot two, 100 pounds and female, and I look like a 12 year old boy. Pretty much Jordan Baker from The Great Gatsby, complete with the athletic body and undercut hairstyle. Setting wise, my bedroom window is at ground level. Part of my room was above ground, and the other half was underground. My window is at grass level, so you can sit down on the grass outside my window and see directly into it if you look straight ahead. The guy in question was called Alex. He's Asian with really short hair and something like five foot four. He's in the same grade as my older sister. He's also an avid user of cigarettes, alcohol, and the green stuff. He even bragged to me that he got his license taken away because he went 60 miles an hour above the speed limit on a highway. A highway with a speed limit of 65. That meant he was going at least 125. So basically, a really ill-behaved boy was chasing a really good girl. I'll give you the entire story now. The second semester of my freshman year, I took an art class in hopes to get an elective credit. I was sitting with some friends talking about the projects we were making and Alex walks through. I'd never noticed him in the class before, which was strange. I should also put this on a timeline for you to make it easier to follow. It was close to prom season, so early March kind of time. And luckily, close to the end of the year. And he started talking about whatever and we really hit it off. After a week, I started to see him popping around me, in the hallways outside my classes, and he talked to me during passing time. I didn't think too much of it, being the stupid naive child I was. I should also mention that he rode my bus in the afternoon after school, and we would sit together on the bus and talk, which I'm sure encouraged his actions further. One day, my older sister Tanya, who is two grades above me, didn't have theatre practice after school, so she took the bus home. When she got on, she saw me sitting next to Alex, and her face turned white, and she sat down near the front of the bus. I thought this was really strange, so I planned on asking her about it when I got off the bus, but I forgot. As prom got even closer, Alex kept talking about it with me. My friend and I all assumed he was going to ask me, because not only did he follow me around and wouldn't stop talking about it, he was clearly showing signs of interest in me. Unfortunately for him, however, I was in a relationship with someone else at the time, and it was a girl. I had absolutely no interest in dating him. If he did ask me though, I would need to say we'd need to go as friends. Thankfully, Alex told me instead that he'd liked me to tell Tanya that if she didn't have a date, that he'd bring her. Almost immediately remembering the incident at the bus, and I said, she's got a date already, but thanks, wanting to protect her. Over the next few days, Alex actually started talking about statistics of doing it. Things like average length of someone's manhood, or the average age that someone loses their virginity. I got very uncomfortable about this and told some of the boys in my class that if it got brought up again, I'd go sit with them and they gladly offered to protect me. This was my first set of red flags. Another instance that set off red flags about Alex was when I was home and the doorbell rang. I looked out the window and Alex was there. This wasn't the strange part because I got off the bus before Alex did, so he saw where I lived. I yelled to my mother that someone was here to see me, and I went out on the front porch to go and speak to him. He was with his friends and yelled to them that he was going to catch up to them later, 
and that he wanted to talk to me first. He talked to me about some mundane stuff, and I was getting bored. So bored, in fact, that I just bluntly decided to ask him if he liked me. I was tired of him always beating around the bush, and I just wanted a stupid answer. Alex kind of froze and danced around the subject confirming my suspicions. The way he avoided telling me that he liked me was really bizarre, bragging about all this other stuff he did. My dad was also just coming home from work at the time, so I had an excuse to leave the really uncomfortable situation. When my dad got to the house, he told me about how nice Alex seemed, and I look over to Tanya but she looked upset about it, but neither of us said a thing. Later though, not on the same day, I posted a picture on my Instagram, and he commented on it. I still don't know how he got my Instagram. But anyway, he commented his phone number, telling me to message him, and that my dad was really chill. Along with the demand for me to message him, he continued to almost harass me on the direct message section of Instagram, asking to hang out. This was another red flag that set things off for me making me very wary of him, and I decided that I needed to be very careful with him from now on. In early May, he continued to follow me from class to class, but from a further distance. This was absolutely mortifying, but my girlfriend at the time thought it was hilarious. She said that it was funny seeing a straight boy chase a gay girl that he had no chance with, I laughed with her on the outside, but internally, I was scared. It was in the same time frame that he actually showed up in my window. I should mention that my parents weren't home at this time either. They were out grocery shopping while all my sisters were home alone with me. I was done with all my homework, and I was practicing my makeup skills so I could do the makeup of a few girls that were going to prom, as only juniors and seniors were allowed to go to prom and underclassmen can only go if they have an upperclassman date. I had my earbuds in and was listening to my music, when I heard some sort of tapping noise. I took them out, listened intently for a minute, and then popped them back in. I heard the tapping noise once more, and removed the earbuds again. Once again, listening. This happened a few more times, until I just kept my earbuds out permanently. I finally heard it, and found it to be coming from my window. I quickly wiped off my makeup and grabbed a pocket knife that I kept under my pillow, opened my curtains, and saw Alex standing there. He was strangely dressed in a three-piece tuxedo, with a single white rose. He said something, but I couldn't hear him through the glass. I yelled through the glass that I was going to come outside and speak with him. As I walked up the stairs to go out, Tani came out looking terrified. She told me to not go out there. I asked her why. She told me that Alex was outside and that he was dangerous. She revealed to me that he had stalked her freshman year and followed her around the way he did with me. We both panicked together, and I heard the garage door open, signalling that our parents were home. We ran to the foyer telling our dad that Alex was outside, and that he needed to do something. He walked over to the side of the house where my window was and spoke to him. I never knew what he said, but it kept Alex away for a while, which was nice. But things then suddenly took a turn for the worse. Alex began speaking with me again, but this time it was about things that made me uncomfortable, worse than before. Telling me about all the substances that he had taken, and about all the girls that he's been with, in extreme detail. I went to go sit with the other boys in the art class, but it did nothing. He still spoke about it, even making one of the hockey players uncomfortable. They did their best to shield me, but it only went so far. This was my final red flag before I deleted his number and blocked him on Instagram. I was too uncomfortable to put myself through any more social interactions with him. The worst it had gotten, though, was two days before the last day of school. I was getting ready for bed at around 10pm, when I heard a knock at my window. 
I once again grabbed my knife and looked out of the window, assuming the worst, but praying for it to just be the bushes outside. I saw a very dark figure, and my heart dropped. I knew it was Alex. I closed my curtains and ran upstairs to my parents' room, almost in tears about him being there. My dad and I both went down to my window and no one was there. My dad thought Alex could still be there, just hiding in the bushes outside my window, and he decided to try and scare him off, and went to turn on the back porch lights and call my dogs. I didn't get any more knocks at my window for maybe two minutes, and I heard another knock and I told my dad. He marched straight out at this point, and found him sitting by my window with his hood up. I don't know what happened, but the police were called, and they had to escort him back to his house. I was terrified, but I was also furious at that point. Why couldn't he just leave me alone? It doesn't stop there though. This is just some additional information regarding this moment. We were on a family vacation, and my dad was retelling this story. He also gave me some information that I didn't know. When he finally did get to speak to Alex, my dad could immediately tell he was both drunk and high. My dad made him empty his pockets and found a large switchblade and the green stuff, making my blood freeze. The next day during my math class, I sat in a spot that faces the window, with my back to the door. Halfway through the hour, one girl in the class shouts my name, telling me to look back. I turn around, as does the rest of the class, and there was Alex, standing intently above me, completely silent. I got up, ready to punch him in the face, but he ran out the door. I just stood in the doorway of the room, and broke into tears. Three other people comforted me, and my girlfriend told the teachers what was going on. The scariest part, however, was that I never told him my schedule. Later that day, my mum, Tanya and I went to the police liaison at our school to get something done. When the officer said we could do a no contact agreement, we ruled it out, because it would take too long to put into place, and with only a few days left in the school year. Later when the officer spoke to Alex, asking him why he did what he did, he said it was just because neither me or my sister told him no. It was the end of the year, and nothing happened with him over the summer. My sophomore year though, I had another class with him. I took this class because my girlfriend and I had a bad breakup, and I needed to change my schedule to avoid her. I immediately told my teacher about everything so that she knew, and everyone in the class protected me from him. I had no further incidents with him that the teacher didn't put a stop to. She cared about me, and is now one of my close friends. My sophomore year was clear of any incidents, and I had pretty much forgotten he existed until recently. I woke up, and checked my phone after turning off my alarm. I saw I had gotten a random Facebook message from someone I didn't know. My Facebook is about as private as it gets so I didn't know that it was possible to receive messages from someone that wasn't your friend. My sophomore year, Alex was supposed to graduate, but he didn't. His name wasn't even said at the ceremony, and wasn't even listed in the program. Tanya and I laughed about it, but we both knew that it meant he was going to be in our city longer. I looked at it anyway, and it was a very dark message. I don't even want to read it out because it was so graphic. It was annoying to get little messages like this all the time from bots on Instagram, so I would have ignored it, but because it was on Facebook Messenger, it was strange. I clicked the person's name, and their profile came up. I scrolled through their pictures, and I saw one that made my heart sink. It was him. He had messaged me, and changed to the profile's name and location. I only showed it to a few people, but not my parents. I showed it to my current boyfriend, who showed it to his mum, the chemistry teacher at the high school we attended, and she told me to inform my parents. The reason we showed it to a teacher was because he'd been seen around the school grounds within the last few weeks, and she may have been able to do something about it. 
nothing has happened to Alex since. But if something else happens, there is a chance he won't make it out of this situation alive. Because I'm fed up with him, and he caused me and my family enough grief. Please be careful who you choose to make friends with, and what sort of information you give out. Don't put yourself through what I've been through. Please. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed tonight's instalment with Stalkers. If you did, don't forget to show this video some love, drop a like, leave a comment with your thoughts, and if you're new here, subscribe and press the bell icon for new stories every night. Because they're pretty good. Now, as I was saying at the start, my brother has an amazing video out on his channel. It really would mean the world to me if you would watch the video. It is so, so good. I'm so proud of him for doing such a great job. And honestly, I think you'll all really enjoy it. So check it out, link in the description and on screen now, and I'll see you all in the next one. Please, please watch it. You won't regret it.